libraries and utilities. It, this is the big one. It does not require any of the toolkits from Linux land. It does not use dbus. It doesn't use console kit, policy kit, systemd, haldi. It doesn't tie in or use any of those. So you can run this completely on the BSDs without a, without a Linux compatibility layer, without linproc FS, without all these extra heavy system daemons running in the background like HALD. You don't need any of those. It is completely independent. And it is already available for PCBSD, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, DragonflyBSD, KFreeBSD, Debian, as well as generic Linux and whatever Linux distros decide to use that model. And I'll show you how we did that here in a little bit. So, okay, now we'll start getting into a little bit more of the nitty gritty right after this slide. But first, how is it designed? It's based on a plugin oriented design philosophy. It is not a standalone design uh, desktop interface pre compiled. The main components are there's one library that Lumina creates and distributed, again, all written in C and Qt. Uh, you then have a session which is the underlying when you start the binary to start up the desktop. That is the piece that is always running and does a few of the main system calls and events to keep up with what's going on with X and what's going on with the window manager just to keep tabs on things. That's the minimal piece that we need to have running at all times in order to interface with the system. Next is the graphical desktop. We actually use one per output monitor. So if you hook up multiple monitors, you will have one of these on top of every single monitor, such as you're seeing here. And this would include the desktop area. You would have panels, which are above everything else, and then also menus, context menus for quick shortcuts and things. Uh, the Lumina Open utility, you'll notice that I'm very imaginative. Every single binary that comes with Lumina is prefixed with Lumina dash. So if you're ever curious about what utilities come with Lumina, just type Lumina dash and hit the tab button and see what other ones are available. I tried to make it really, really easy to find them. The Lumina Open utility is what's tied into the XDG Open script, which is used for the free desktop standards of providing cross desktop compatibility for all the applications to launch files or other applications. So that, for instance, if you're in Firefox, you downloaded a file and you say, oh, I want to open that file now. Firefox would then just run XDG open file. And then that would immediately say, oh, I'm running in the Lumina desktop environment. I'm going to redirect that and send it over to Lumina open. And then Lumina open says, oh, you want this file? Well, here's your list of default applications. That file type corresponds to this one here. And then it launches the appropriate application to open that file. So that's what that utility is for. It's just to provide all those, uh, util that, that usage. And then there's a few other small utilities. And here is a diagram of all the utilities that Lumina creates and kind of how they are arranged. So for instance, what you'll see here is if you're using a graphical login manager or if you're just ran manually starting X, that would be right here. That's where you would start. The Lumina-DE binary in user local bin, that is your main entrance point to starting the, des the Lumina desktop. From there, that sets up all the general environment variables. It sets up the session. It, it in, installs some things onto the uh, X server. Well, it doesn't install things. It sets up the registrations for a number of things, like system trays and stuff like that, onto the X server. It starts up the screensaver in the window manager on the left as external processes, but keeps tabs on them to make sure that they do not just get randomly crashed or closed. It'll try and restart them, make sure that everything stays sane while your session is running. It uses numlock x just to make sure you know if you want to have numlock on when you log into the desktop it'll use that I'm still trying to get rid of that it has time for you that special key code to send to x so that was the easy way to do that and then the lumina open utility i mentioned the other one which is where you require the functionality but it's not necessary you don't need the utility itself is one that i wrote called lumina config and that's a single utility to do any configuration of anything in the lumina desktop environment so if you don't like a desktop, if you don't like a panel, if you want to rearrange things, you want to add and remove uh, interface elements, you just go to one utility and that'll let you do everything for that. This utility itself, you can see here I have listed under functionality is required. You don't necessarily need the utility itself. I mean, that utility is more designed and laid out for traditional desktop usage. But if you're distributing this on some kind of smartphone, you might want to write your own little smartphone version of a configuration utility that just sets those values and provides that access for you. Just something to let the user modify their desktop. 
And then finally, you'll notice a bunch of other optional utilities, all with Lumina Dash on them. These are all extra utilities that were written either by myself or one of our other contributors just for general desktop usage. And I hate to say this, but most desktop users are really, really spoiled from the Linux land. They expect that when they install a desktop, it installs a web browser, it installs you know, a text editor, it installs you know, whatever. So we haven't gone that far, but we did create a few tiny utilities for specific usage they're not running all the time. They're just there if you want them, if you need them. And one of those being a file manager, uh, Lumina Info for just giving you general information about the Lumina desktop, what version it is, stuff like that. File Info, you know, read the permissions on files. Screenshot, if you want to take screenshots of your desktop. I actually wrote that one in a couple hours simply because people kept asking, well, what does Lumina look like? And it's like, OK, then I'll write something so I can take screenshots and show you. Um, and then Lumina X Config. That's for uh, using XRNR so that if you plug in an external monitor, you can just open that utility and say, oh, okay, I want a new monitor over there. So it'll create a new desktop on that other monitor for you and hook it up into X properly so that you have two monitors. And then Lumina Search is one just to say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm looking for this file or this directory, you know, type in the name, and it'll actually go through and search your directory really quick. It's not tied to some large background daemon like you get in KDE. It just does it right then on demand so it's not eating up memory in the back end. And then I use a couple other small utilities as well, X brightness, X term as necessary. All right, so let's go into the session itself a little bit and see how that's organized. Uh, so you have the operating system as your base level, the display server, which in this case is X11, running on top of that. And then the Lumina session has a couple different interfaces to those. The two classes in the bottom, Lumina OS and Lumina X11, those are single classes within the lib Lumina, the library that comes with Lumina. So what we can do is if you ever need to change something or if you're trying to port this to a different operating system, there is only a single class that you ever need to touch or check to make sure that that works properly on your operating system. This makes Lumina extremely portable, and I'll go into more later about what it, what's in that class and where it's been ported and its level of support. Similarly, to interface between the Lumina session and the X11, the display server, there's a single class written to do that. Reason for this being, what about these other new display servers which are being written, which everybody keeps asking me about? Mer, Wayland, you know, whatever else might come. Eventually, we're gonna have support for these, and I hope that they will probably be better than X. They probably will be. But you know, I hope they're better than X. So in order to future-proof the project, we want to make sure that it's easy to maintain and upgrade later. So a single class, all we need to do is go through and re-implement re that one class in the new display system. And there we go. The entire Lumina desktop will work on it. Um, so then up in the Lumina session, I mentioned it starts external processes up there. So you have your screensaver, your window manager, any other services or applications. Those all get spawned off as external processes out of the session as necessary. Um, embedded within the session, though, are things like your system tray registrations. So it actually has to register things on the X server saying, yes, there is a system tray available. So that when you start up a system tray app, it says, hey, I'm here. And then something else says, OK, I'll take you. All right. Otherwise, you run into the issue where a system tray app starts up while well, there's no tray running. You start up the tray, and then that app is still running in the background. And it's never actually embedded in the tray. So you just have some floating process in your background just hiding on your system, eating up memory, and not actually visible or usable. So that actually gets started up right near the beginning of the Lumina session before any of the external uh, services and applications are started up. So whenever you have tray applications, they'll always be caught. Similarly, the task manager, because that's, again, highly tied to the X11 server and the, the extended window manager hints. That's managed within the session, and then the interface elements can just probe the session and say, hey, session, give me a list of all the windows that are out there. And it'll say, oh, here you go. So it doesn't actually have to talk to the, to the uh, display server itself. Similarly, the config watcher. Uh, one of my biggest gripes with a lot of window managers is that they have all their nice text config files. You go in there, you change it, and nothing changes on the window manager. It doesn't detect when its own configuration got modified or changed. So Qt has a couple nice methods of doing that called uh, file system watchers. 
and you can just install a watcher on every single one of my little config files. And so I've got one watcher there. It's just watching my config files. And whenever one of them changes, it says, ooh, I detected a change. And then it sends a signal upstream saying, hey, everybody, this file changed. So everybody that will use that file will automatically reload it and make sure that it corresponds to what's in the file now. Finally, within the Lumina desktop, we have what's called the L desktop class. And that's the interface, the one that spawns and actually creates the visual part of Lumina. So for every single monitor that you get, you're going to have a single instance of an L desktop class, which creates your interface on that screen. Within that interface itself, you're going to have a few other things. There's panels, which are reserved screen space, which are always on top of everything else. So you have your general applications and general windows. You want those to be anywhere on the screen except for in this little bar here. Those things should always be on top. And that's what the purpose of a panel is. Context menu. When you click on the desktop, you want to see things, quick menus and shortcuts and things. That's what the context menu is. And then the desktop plugin area. That's where you provide your wallpaper, your splash screen on the background. But then it also lets you embed interface elements directly into it and let you move things around and rearrange your actual interface however you would like. These are all governed by, again, I have the, their uh, plugins. These are all C++ Qt embedded plugins. They are not external libraries that are loaded. They are actually just contained separately within the Lumina source tree so that whenever you have a version of the Lumina desktop, you can be sure that every single plugin listed will work with that version of the desktop. We don't need to worry about, oh, some external plugin over here, which works great for showing me the weather, but it only worked with a desktop you know, 20 versions old. It doesn't work now. So you don't have to worry about any types of issues or incompatibility between versions, between the plugins and the desktop. I actually recently, just within the last couple days, finished putting in a new type of plugin container as well, which will let people script their own plugins. So instead of having it compiled in, to Lumina, you can write your own plugin in QML, which again, only requires Qt. It doesn't require Python or Ruby or any of those other things. But you can now start writing your own QML plugins, interface plugins, and those can all be added directly. Oh, wrong way. All right, so how is it configured? Uh, Text-based configuration files located in your home directory, the .lumina subdirectory. Pretty simple, most everybody does that. Um, for new users, however, if you don't have that directory existing when you first try to log into Lumina, it will instead go and read the luminadesktop.conf file on your system. This would be the single file that was mentioned earlier that the distributor would provide. Yes? Why not .config? Why not .config? Um, because a lot of things like to access .config, and because the desktop is such an overriding uh, process on the system, we don't want anything else messing with it uh, unnecessarily. Um, there are lots of applications which probe .config to find configuration files and expect things to adhere to certain formats. Um, these are just one of the things that we decided to do is to make it work because it uses queue settings for all the settings files in the back end instead of using some of these other standard file formats. Like it doesn't work with UCL, libucl, or any of those other uh, settings formats for the actual settings files. The system default file, though, is does correspond to, uh, I just changed that within the last couple of days so that you can use it with libucl as well to read and write that file. But that file is basically parsed and then splits up all those values between the you know, 10 or 20 config files that it might need to go into, depending on what you have there. Um, for every new version of the desktop, the session and config files are evaluated for any changes which might be necessary for backwards compatibility. Backwards compatibility is a big thing for me. I really hate it when you get a new version of the desktop, you log into it, and everything is broken. Simply because you had an old version of this config, I'm sorry, that doesn't work with the new version. So Lumina actually has a method where within your session config file, it saves what the last version of the desktop was that you logged into it from. So if you, the last time you logged in, it was version 0.3. The next time you logged in, it's 0.4. Oh, you upgraded Lumina. Let's go through and see if there was anything different between 0.3, 0.4 that I need to adjust config files for to make sure to continue, everything continues on. Such as um, recently between 0.3 and 0.4, we changed the entire backend system for setting favorites. So it said, OK, so we'll read the old favorites from 0 
just convert those into the new system for 0 0.4 and continue on. So this is all done transparently, so you never have to worry about you're losing your favorites just from upgrading versions of Lumina. It automatically keeps things up to date as you're going forward. And that conversion will only happen if you go forward. If you take it back to that old system running 0 0.3, it won't reconvert anything back. So you might lose your favorites on the other system, but <laughs> hopefully that won't have to happen. <sighs> okay. System defaults. Here's an example of that Lumina desktop .conf. Uh, This is actually just changed. Instead of dots separating as uh, separations within the variables, it changed to underscores for the libucl compatibility. But it's really, really simple for a distributor to set. Oh, do you want to play the audio when you log in or log out? True or false? Uh, what is your default web browser? You know, provide the path to that desktop file. Um, what list of files do you want to use for your wallpapers? You know, one or many. If many, how many minutes do you want between rotations for you know, cycling to the next wallpaper? Uh, list your plugins for the desktop, the panel, the menu, whatever it is. You know, give, give me a list. What do you want them? And then favorites. Do you want to add or remove favorites from the registration? Because, for instance, with PCBSD, we come with three things that we expect on the user's desktop, no matter what desktop it is, out of box. A link to the handbook, a link to the control panel, and a link to the app cafe where you can go download software and download and install software. So on the PCBSD side of things, we would just say, oh, favorites. I want to add a favorite for each of those three things. We've already made sure that every home directory has a, desktop, uh, a file on, in their desktop folder for those. So that'll automatically show up as well. And then, oh, we can also modify the wallpaper file so it shows the PCBSD wallpaper when you log in. Again, provide, giving the user the ability to change it later. So if you need something else, if you are more of a distributor of interfaces or of systems and you need some other hook, there's a lot more in the file. I didn't list them all here, but it's extremely easy to add more. <laughs> Just let me know and we can add more hooks for you. Does it have a plan for supporting Wayland? I mentioned this before with the operating system and X11 uh, libraries. Uh, we keep everything highly segregated within that library so that we only have one place to go, one class that we need to update in order to support all these various systems, operating systems, graphical systems, whatever it might be. And then here's some of the specialized classes within the li Lumina library, the X11, XDG, OS, themes, single application, and utils. Single application is actually an interesting one because uh, QT4 used to have an optional module for single application. That basically means that if you try to start up two instances of the same application, which is registered as a single application, the second one will check and say, wait a minute, I'm already running over there. It will close itself and send a ping to the first one. And that's what I did, but I custom wrote it in QT5 just for Lumina itself because that module disappeared with the move from QT4 to QT5. So we had to find some way to re-implement it. So that'll just make sure that if you try to spawn two instances of the Lumina configuration tool, the second instance will say, oh, wait a minute, I'm already running over there. It'll close itself, send a ping to the first one, and the first one will raise itself so it's not hidden or you know, whatever, wherever it might be if you forgot about it. And then just some general purpose functions in the utils. All right, what about the operating system? I mentioned before that that single class allows the ability for portability. And I mentioned all the different operating systems that it's already ported to. And this is how we've been ported to so many places already. Simply because that one class, I just need somebody from that operating system who uses that operating system to look at that file and say, OK, I'll make sure this works. I'll make sure that works. And here's a list of some of the things that are in there. Do you have a quick link to a control panel? If so, it'll embed that control panel directly into the interface for Lumina. So like the settings menu will have a shortcut to the control panel. Or the App Store. In PCBSD's case, that would be the App Cafe. Uh, for Debian, uh, that would be the Synaptic pa Package Manager. Um, does it have a link to some kind of QT5 configuration tool? That's more of a leftover from when we were in QT4, because there was QT, uh, QT4-config or something like that, which has made it really easy to set defaults for all QT4 applications. I have not found something that corresponds to that for QT5 yet, which is why we're on no for PCBSD and FreeBSD, but it's also not good that four of them have not been updated and removed that QT4 utility. <laughs> so what you see here is red means there's no support for it whatsoever. Blue means good. They're on top of things. It's up to date. And then purple means they have somewhat support. 
For instance, if you look at the screen brightness, on PCBSD we have support for setting both hardware screen brightness and if that monitor doesn't have hardware screen brightness that can be set for some reason, it'll resort to software screen brightness where it'll actually change X itself. Won't save you power, but you still get the same effect of dimming the screen. Um, whereas you go through the other ones, FreeBSD only has the software side, Dragonfly only has the software side, and these other ones have hardware settings with X backlight. And I specifically mentioned the with X backlight because that's a little X utility specifically for doing hardware stuff, but it is flaky is the best way to say it. It works sometimes, it doesn't work other times, it's very, very flaky. So what they would have there is it might work on some systems and other times when you change your brightness nothing will happen. So that's not really recommended. I would prefer to fall back on the software rendering so that when somebody touches the brightness slider you expect it to change the brightness right away. Either hardware if possible or fall back on the software just so that you can reduce the screen brightness. And then you can see all these other things. Audio volume. Do you have an audio mixer? Can the system put, be put into the suspend state? Uh, do you have a battery monitor? And then I have some more here. Uh, file system capacities, checksums. Uh, this one was recently added, which is why not too many people have it, but CPU temperature, usage, memory usage. Um, so there's a new desktop plugin which was just recently added to, that you can put on there and it'll display the nice system information like CPU and memory usage. What's the temperature of all your CPUs? I also just added another function too called uh, disk usage. So that'll let you show you the disk read writes to every one of your disks to let you know if you're pegging out one of your disks or not. Um, so that's all there. And, and then shutdown access check. Does this user have the permissions to be able to shut down the system or restart the system? If not, don't give those as options for them in the logout menu. Just give them the option to log out. That kind of thing. And so that just gives you a general idea here. What about near future plans? Uh, I mentioned before that we're still using Fluxbox as the window manager and X screensaver for screensaver management. The next big plan for 0 0.9, we'll keep doing uh, maintenance point releases like 0 0.8 dot, you know, whatever. I think we're, on, we're working on dot 5 right now. Uh, we'll keep doing and continuing that while we're working on the window manager. But once we have the window manager done and ready for people to use, that's when we'll go to 0 0.9. And this new window manager is going to combine the functionality of the window manager, the screensaver, and a power manager for the system. Because they all are essentially the same thing. They're all event-based on the back end with X events. But they all function at different times. So for instance, when the window manager is active and showing everything, the screensaver isn't running. It's just resetting a timer whenever there's a new input event, so it's saying not to show the, win the screensaver for X amount of time. But the inverse is, op is possible as well. If the screensaver is active, the window manager shouldn't be popping up windows onto your screen, especially if it, the screen is locked. Because you don't want anybody who's just sitting at the computer to have a window pop up over your screensaver and give them access to it. It's a security issue. So you have that flip side. So it's good to put those in the same utility to ensure compatibility between all the different systems because they really do run at different times and should be operating in different modes, such as if the screen is locked, if the screensaver is on or off. Is, you know, what kind of window management do you need on this system? Do you need a tiled window manager? Do you need a layered window manager? Do you need a single, wi single window manager where you can only have one application at a time? You know, that kind of thing. And then, uh, power management, well, we might as well do that as well because, again, it's all based on the same thing. So when you're in a screensaver, reduce the screen brightness as well if you're on a, a mobile device, if you have a battery, just to try and save battery life and stuff like that. Uh, another one that we've been evaluating and looking into is integrating capsicum usage on FreeBSD. Are any, is anyone here familiar with capsicum? You are. I would love to talk to you afterwards and figure out how we can get this in there. I have been reading through it and stuff, but I'm having difficulties just understanding it. I know the general premise, but actually how to implement it, I would love to do. Because I would love to have Lumina be the first completely Capsicum locked uh, desktop operating system or desktop interface around. That's going to be a lot of work, I know. I know a lot of people looked into trying to do it for KDE, but they finally abandoned it after looking at the scope of the project, and it's like, that's going to be massive. There's no way to do it. In the app side? Okay. See that? And that's exactly what I need to know and talk to people about. 
But since Lumina is still in the early beta stages, now is the time before we get large, before the project starts to grow, and just in case it grows out of control. I hope it doesn't, but just in case it does grow out of control, now is the time to start doing these things like capsicum so that we don't have to worry about doing it later once it's a monster. Um, and then we're just going to continue to create additional plugins, uh, color schemes, themes, things like that. And that is the end of my talk. I will take questions now. If you want, I will just close this window and give you demonstrations as well. So first off, let's just do questions. Yes? How do you support desktop files with their stuff? What was that? How do you support desktop files with their stuff? Desktop files don't need dbus. It's actually an optional extension to the desktop format. It is not required. is still listed in the current specs as completely optional usage with fallback methods using the exec strings and icons. Okay. Then Lumina will not support XDG after that. We will not be about integrating Dbus in any way. I have evaluated it a couple times and com had to completely reject it. We can talk about that more later. <laughs> Any other questions? No? All right. Well, let me just close this and give you an example. So this is my Lumina desktop that I have here. You can see it's quite easy. It looks like the projector might be cutting off a tiny bit on the left side. Yeah, there's a shift here, but that's okay. So you get the general idea. So this is your interface. This is the one that I like to have on my system. Um, up here, it would have what I call the panel. So it's reserved space. You can't put anything over it. Any other applications will always be under it. If you right click, that'll open up the context menu. These are all, again, plugins that are set here. The bottom two are the only ones that are required on the desktop. One, because you need to make sure that the user has the ability to log out. That's kind of important. And two, the ability to unlock the desktop. This unlocks all the desktop plugins. And you can see that everything here, the entire interface, is all completely optional and can be completely moved around. So by a smart creation of plugins, you can put them however you want and to fit whatever type of system you would like. Most of the plugins we have right now are more for traditional desktop usage. We still haven't written a lot of the mobile side of things. But it should be fairly easy, especially with the new QML format uh, for plugins, to easily write touch-based and smartphone versions of plugins. And then you can lock and unlock, you can resize, you can close them, etc. And then snap them to a grid as well. That was another thing I added too. This one here, this plugin here is called Desktop View. That's how you would implement your standard desktop icons. It reads everything from the user's desktop folder and then creates an icon for everything in there. If it's shortcuts, it gives you the full icon and name and stuff. If it's files, it'll show you the icon for that MIME type, etc. So that would be your traditional thing. So instead of being forced to have your screen covered by a system of icons based on whatever's in your desktop folder, you could actually just remove that plugin or not put that plugin there and you would have a clean desktop. What we do is, this is one of my favorite plugins, which I wrote here. I call it the user button. It's a panel plugin. And what this does is it gives you access to everything in the desktop folder, as well as everything that you have uh, marked as a favorite, be it an application, a directory, a file within Lumina. So right off the bat, these are all your favorites. Everything that's in your desktop folder is considered a favorite. And those ones you can see because you can actually trash it. You can destroy. Uh, things, f files directly from your desktop folder right from here as necessary. So for instance, I'm just going to remove, there, I removed that shortcut to the PCBSD handbook from my desktop. And then the ones with minuses are just internal favorites. So you can add and remove all the, those all day long. It doesn't actually touch any files on your system. Similarly, you can make, uh, I don't have any directories favorited at the moment. I do have a couple files, however, such as my presentation, a couple different methods. But then also in these other tabs, you can have links to all the applications registered on your system. So here you would have you know, all sorts of stuff. This is just the everything. You can scroll through that, or you can go through and list them by category. Plus, if your operating system has an app store registered, 
it will provide a link to it right there. So if you're looking at applications, oh, can't find what you're looking for, click that button, go download and install it. Keeping it nice and simple. They also get you a full directory tree within Lumina as well, if you click on this tab. So there's my home directory. There's all the folders I have there. I can just click through and say, OK, I want to go into documents. Oh, I don't have any other directories there. But maybe I just want to open it up. If I click that button, it'll open it in the file manager, whatever file manager you have registered. Or you hit this button, and then you can start searching that directory immediately. So if I do that, this will actually run the Lumina search utility that I mentioned before. It just opens it up. It's already set for that directory. And what do you want? I want Lumina. I think I've got a couple. Yep, there we go. So there's my two files again, my two presentations. And then I can just click one of those and say Launch. And then I'll open it up. It makes it very easy. You can also search for applications in here. And there's a couple applications that also correspond to the search Lumina. It's all very fast. Don't need any background daemons. So that's the user button. Oh, there's also just any configuration tools in there as well. So if you have these configuration tools available, it'll give you links to it. So PCBSD control panel, the Lumina config utility, which I'll show you, uh, Lumina X config, and then how to change your screensaver settings with X screensaver. And then a little thing about the Lumina desktop. And then for the plugins I have on the panel up there, I just have the task manager. And I have the more uh, minimal task manager. It just uh, groups together all the buttons so that each button is smaller. I also have the full-blown task manager where it shows you the name of the application next to the icon, and each one has their own button and stuff. There's a couple different versions of task managers available. System tray clock. And then the system dashboard is another one I like, simply because that provides a lot of the OS interfaces. So for instance, you want to reduce your system volume. You want to lower your screen brightness. You want to see how your battery is doing right now, which is actually doing pretty well there. Switch between virtual workspaces. So you can switch between all those or just log out. And actually, let me just show you that. There's the log out menu, if you want to see. So you get right there, you can log out, restart, shut down if your user is, uh, has permissions for that. Or you can lock the screen or suspend the session as well, again, if your operating system supports it. But then if I open up the config tool, you can see here it's very easy to change appearance. I have two screens here, apparently. I don't know where the other one is. It looks like the first one is being cloned <laughs> instead. So, But you can change your wallpapers easily. You can add colors, uh, just image files like this one. It'll automatically stretch it or crop it to fit the screen, whatever it is. I like that it tells you your screen resolution as well. I've used lots of desktops and lots of systems where I say, yeah, set a wallpaper image. I don't know how large the wallpaper image needs to be for my screen, though. <laughs> <laughs> So this will tell you what the current screen resolution is for that monitor. So it's very easy to say, OK, I want an image which is this big or larger. But you could put in something smaller. It'll just stretch it and might not look as nice. Also rotate if you have multiple things. And then what if you want to change themes? You know, Set your font, set your font size. So if you're on a big screen, you might want to bump that font size up a little bit so you can see it from the couch. But then another thing I implemented within Lumina is the distinction between a theme and a color scheme. Uh, you can set up themes completely, but then what most people don't want to get writing themes. That's getting into a lot of details and stuff that most people really don't want to delve into. It's written using uh, QSS, um, which is very similar to CSS. But again, it's getting into nitty gritty stuff, which most people want to do, don't want to do. But a lot of people do just want to change the colors. So I distinguish them so you can set up color schemes as well as themes, and you can just switch between them. So I'll go to a dark color scheme here, the Lumina purple one. And it'll just change everything to do that. Again, hasn't touched my wallpaper image. That's a different hook. So you can might want to, because you might have those on rotate, and you know, a ro bu rotate a bunch of dark themes or whatever. But you can do that. Or this, you'll notice that it says here in parentheses system. Those are the ones that come prepackaged with Lumina itself. When you install Lumina, those are the themes and color schemes that are come out of box. If you hit the Edit button, though, you can make any changes and save it locally for that user. And those will also show up in the list. So you can have the exact, something with the exact same name, but registered just for that user with you know, some tweaks to the color, some tweaks to the CSS, depending on what you want. So it's very easy to customize your system however you would want it to. 
add interface elements. So if you click this button, that's where it gives you the option to add things to your actually desktop. So things like the calendar, the desktop view, the notepad, things like that. Uh, your right-click menu. There's a bunch of things here. If you click plus, you can add other things into there. Do I want an application list? Do I want a shortcut to a particular application? Do I want the shortcut to the file manager or just a line separating it? That's just for nice visuals if you want to separate some items and put them in groups. Shortcut to the terminal. Task manager again in the, in the window list. There's another one. Or you can come over here to panels. And right now, the Lumina config utility only supports two panels. I'm actually working on updating that because you can put something like 12 or more on the Lumina desktop right now because you can set them by a percentage of size, and then you can pin them in different areas, the le top left, center, bottom right, depending on whether it's a vertical or horizontal panel, and then put whatever size you want. And then similarly, they also have plugins. So you can add whatever you want onto the plugin and arrange them, put them in different orders. And then all you got to do is hit Save, and it'll instantly work. So for instance, let's just. Just move the system dashboard plugin over. And it switched over. So now it's on the left side of my system tray. Very easy to configure. Change around, add, remove plugins. And it all instantly takes effect. Uh, set up your defaults. Do you want any auto started applications? These are all the things registered on the system, which Lumina will start up by default. This is a PCBSD system, so you'll see lots of PCBSD uh, background daemons and stuff. But you can also set in here. Oh, I want my default web browser, email client, file manager, virtual terminal, or you can go through all the different MIME types and set different things. And you can do them all right through there, and they show you the file extensions as well as the actual MIME type. Similarly, uh, if you try to open a file but you don't have a default set, it will just pop up a little window saying, oh, I don't have a default set for this application. And it will give you a list of all the applications that say they can open up that type of file. And if you don't find something on that list, there's another tab which just lists every application on the system. And then once you have it, you can say, oh, set that as my default and go. It's very nice and simple. You don't have to worry about missing registrations. You can just add them as you need them. So this is just a general walkthrough of Lumina. I mean, do you have any questions? I know we're pretty much out of time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's the whole point of writing the uh, Lumina X config utility. I mean, I, let me show it to you here. I think I've got because I actually have two screens right now that the second one can't be seen because it's cloning the interface instead. It's just a little utility I wrote. It's to XRNR. It's not as full featured as a lot of the other XRNR front ends that you would have. But this is all written in Qt. It doesn't require anything else, just XRNR in the background. So it says, OK, there's the screen I'm using right now. That's my laptop screen. Oh, there's also a VGA1 over here. I'm going to move that, and I want to put it to the right of this screen. And it'll do it on the fly with its own resolution. And the Lumina desktop will put something on it, put a desktop on it with whatever resolution that would be. What I still need to do is say, oh, if this desktop has never been used before, check the resolution, you know, try and estimate what the size of the screen is, and then use this file to fill it with whatever it might be. So that if you don't have a configuration for a mobile phone and you plug that in, it will give you one instead of just being a blank screen. Whereas right now, that's what the system default file is for, but that's primarily just for the first screen. It doesn't do it for screens that you add on later on. Not yet, at least. That's where we're still trying to add things. Any other questions? The question about desktop background. Mm -hmm. Does Lumina support adding any additional picture for each uh, screen? Yes. Because every monitor is treated completely separately, you can give each monitor completely different lists of files to use for, for screens. You can set one of them as a static image or color. You can set another one with a list of 20 files and have it rotate every minute. You can set another one with a list of three files and have it rotate every half hour. They're all managed independently. Any other questions? And then we're done. Uh, what was the URL of your slide presentation? Oh, it's on SlideShare? Uh, just look for beanpole135. That's my username on SlideShare. 
I just uploaded it there earlier this morning, so it's all up. All right, then. Thank you very much.